All right, breaking news at 7 p.m. in Atlanta, Georgia. You can hear the cheers starting for Kamala Harris, who will soon take the stage uh, as we look out. One of the warm-up speakers is there, Reno, Nevada, screen right, awaiting uh, J.D. Vance coming to the stage. I think we have the locators mixed there, but we'll, we'll get it right here soon. Just 17 days after the assassination attempt on Donald Trump, both sides have fully walked away from trying to lower the temperature. The verbal attacks are getting more vile by the day. It is red hot, you might say, on the campaign trail. Kind of matches the temperatures outside. We welcome you to the Ferris Show on television. Day nine so far, and Kamala Harris is sticking to the script if she continues to script to stick to the script, as I should when I read the teleprompter, this is going to be a huge problem for Donald Trump. The Harris campaign is modeling her 2024 bid similar to Joe Biden's in 2020. Biden, of course, stayed out of the public view and literally in his basement because of COVID. Harris is playing it safe, playing rallies where she reads off the teleprompter. She's gotten a lot better at that than she was in her failed presidential campaign. The message is short, sweet, tough on Donald Trump, and very rehearsed. She will speak for an average of 14 minutes and 38 seconds. That's the average of the past six public events she's held in the last two weeks. Trump's campaign tells the Daily Caller they plan to use the debate, now more than a month off, as their one opportunity to get Harris off script. We'll see. Suggesting that her past gaffes or awkward moments will be the defining moment. And to be fair, Trump said that about the debate with Biden. It turned out to be true. Will Kamala Harris make the same mistake? And when you compare the campaign since Biden left the race, things are vastly different. Trump and Harris have the same number of events. Trump's spoken for far longer. But Trump has held five interviews. Harris has not done any. In an interesting turn of events, an irony, you might say, Tomorrow, Donald Trump will be interviewed by the National Association of Black Journalists. Kamala Harris declined the invitation. More on that later. This strategy allows her to avoid answering any specific questions about policy and also any specific questions about what she knew about Joe Biden and his cognitive decline. Instead, voters only know her as the California prosecutor who's ready to stand up to Trump and continue down the path that Joe Biden has set for the nation. That is basically what her stump speech is, as is her new ad. The one thing Kamala Harris has always been, fearless. As a prosecutor, she put murderers and abusers behind bars. As California's attorney general, she went after the big banks and won $20 billion for homeowners. And as vice president, she took on the big drug companies to cap the cost of insulin for seniors. On the flip side, Republicans are still hammering Harris on the border. That's J.D. Vance's line. He'll use it again in Reno. Trump's latest ad repeats claims that she failed the country on immigration. This is America's border czar, and she's failed us. Under Harris, over 10 million illegally here. A quarter of a million Americans dead from fentanyl. Brutal migrant crimes. And ISIS now here. All right, as we await both Vance and Harris, News Nation senior political contributor, Pulitzer Prize winning columnist George Will is with us. George, uh, Wall Street Journal editorializes Kamala Harris confounds the Republicans. Uh, really? If Kamala Harris confounds you, what is Donald Trump going to do with Xi Jinping, Vladimir Putin, the Ayatollahs, and the list goes on? You say, Josh, she hasn't had any interviews. She can't leave them until her whisperers tell her what she believes this month. The fact is, you know, it's a shame that Vance and Harris can't run on the same ticket because it could be the oh, never mind ticket. <laughs> Vance ran, spoke for years and years about, hit, uh, about Trump being a Hitler auditioning, about him being cultural heroin, about him being a cancer on American politics. Then he said, oh, never mind. And he decided that he didn't believe any of those things. Kamala Harris was opposed to fracking, never mind that 300,000 Pennsylvania jobs depend on it. She was against private insurance, Medicaid for all, more or less open borders, and hooray for sanctuary cities and ending ice. Now she says, oh, never mind. But now she's an empty vessel. 
And they're trying to fill her up with yeah. views that don't offend 90% of the American people. Right. That was kind of, to be fair, right, a little bit like what happened with Joe Biden, is that they kept him so isolated that you could graft on basically anything you didn't like about Donald Trump, Joe Biden became the vessel for, uh, being the opposite of that. Therefore, um, he won. J.D. Vance, speaking of which, I think said the quiet part out loud when he said um, that Democrats sucker punched Republicans by the switch to Kamala Harris and the speed which it happened. Mike Tyson famously said, everybody has a plan until they are punched in the face. How long can Republicans flounder before they need a plan? They can flounder until someone, it might be the press, it might be her colleagues, tell Kamala Harris that she has to come out of this, out of this fog of, oh, never minds, and tell us what she really believes. She was opposed to fracking, now she's for it. Why? She was opposed to private health insurance and for Medicaid for all, now she's reversed her position. Why? These questions are going to be asked, I assume, certainly in the debate, if not before. Well, you say assume. <clears throat> we have no reason to believe that her handlers are going to let her out of these extraordinarily scripted moments and events. And friendly interviewers are not going to ask those questions. It's going to require her to sit down. Um, they use the term big boy press conference for Joe Biden um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a real interview that a presidential candidate would get. Mark Halpern was on the show last night. He suggested, and I think there's something to this, that it's possible she could go the whole campaign without one of those moments. Well, the trouble with trying to go the whole campaign is, A, that becomes the theme of the campaign, the way she's campaigning. But second, Leland, we've seen her off script. We've seen the word salads that come pouring out of her, and they really can't risk another thing, such as her soliloquy on electric school buses or her musings on the importance of space. Well, we can see now the energy of this crowd, um, which is things that Joe Biden only dreamed of being possible. And now the vice president of the United States has raucous enthusiasm in Georgia. Thank you for welcoming us to Atlanta, and thank you to the 
great Stacey Abrams. For your extraordinary leadership. So, Georgia, it is so good to be back. And I am very clear. The path to the White House runs right through this state. And you all helped us win in 2020, and we're going to do it again in 2024. Yes, we will. Yes, we will. So let's get right down. <laughs> so. So I'm going to I'm, I'm get into some business now. Okay. I'm going to get into some business now. All right. So, Georgia, as many of you know, before, and have a seat if you have a chair. <laughs> um, as many of you know, before I was elected vice president and before I was elected a United States Senator, I was an elected attorney general and an elected district attorney. And before that, I was a courtroom prosecutor. So in those roles, I took on perpetrators of all kinds. Predators who abused women. Fraudsters who ripped off consumers. Cheaters who broke the rules for their own gain. So hear me when I say, I know Donald Trump's type. I know the type. And I have been dealing with people like him my entire career. For example, as Attorney General of California, I took on one of our country's largest for-profit colleges that was scamming students. Well, Donald Trump ran a for-profit college that scammed students. As a prosecutor, I specialized in child sexual abuse cases and sexual abuse cases. Well, Trump was found liable for committing sexual abuse. And as an attorney general, I held the big Wall Street banks accountable for fraud. Donald Trump was just found guilty of fraud. 34 counts. So in this, so in this campaign, So in this campaign, I will proudly put my record against his any day of the week. Any day of the week. Including, for example, on the issue of immigration. So I was the attorney general of a border state. In that job, I walked underground tunnels between the United States and Mexico on that border with law enforcement officers. I went after transnational gangs, drug cartels, and human traffickers that came into our country illegally. I prosecuted them in case after case, and I won. Donald Trump... <laughs> Donald Trump, on the other hand, has been talking a big game about securing our border, but he does not walk the walk. Or as my friend Quavo would say, he does not walk it like he talks it. administration worked on the most significant border security bill in decades. Some of the most conservative Republicans in Washington, D.C. supported the bill. Even the Border Patrol endorsed it. It was all set to pass. But at the last minute, 
Trump directed his allies in the Senate to vote it down. Right. He tanked, tanked the bipartisan deal because he thought it would help him win an election. Which goes to show Donald Trump does not care about border security. He only cares about himself. And when I am president, I will work to actually solve the problem. So here is my pledge to you. As president, I will bring back the border security bill that Donald Trump killed, and I will sign it into law and show Donald Trump what real leadership looks like. But make no mistake, this campaign is not just about us versus Donald Trump. Truly, this campaign is about two very different visions for our nation. One focused on the future, the other focused on the past. We believe in a future where every person has the opportunity to build a business, to own a home, to build intergenerational wealth, a future with affordable health care, affordable child care, paid leave. And all of this is to say, Building up the middle class will be a defining goal of my presidency. Because we here all know when our middle class is strong, America is strong. And to keep our middle class strong, Families need relief from the high cost of living so that they have a chance not just to get by, but to get ahead. And yes, it is true that by many indicators, our economy is the strongest in the world. But while inflation is down and wages are up, prices are still too high. You know it and I know it. And when we win this election, here's what we're going to do about it. On day one, I will take on price gouging and bring down costs. We will ban more of those hidden fees and surprise late charges that banks and other companies use to pad their profits. We will take on corporate landlords and cap unfair rent increases. And we will take on Big Pharma to cap prescription drug costs for all Americans. Our plan will lower costs and save many middle class families thousands of dollars a year. But Donald Trump has a different plan in mind, one that would raise prices on middle-class families. Just look at his Project 2025 agenda. I take it you've seen it. Project 2025 is a plan to weaken the middle class. Be clear. And Donald Trump intends to cut Social Security and Medicare He intends to give tax breaks to billionaires and big corporations. He intends to gut our investments in clean energy jobs. He intends to end the Affordable Care Act. 
to take us back to a time when insurance companies had the power to deny people with pre-existing conditions. You guys remember what that was? <laughs> Children with asthma, breast cancer survivors, grandparents with diabetes. Georgia, America has tried these failed policies before, and we are not going back. because ours is a fight for the future. And it is a fight for freedom. Across our nation, we are witnessing a full-on assault on hard-fought, hard-won freedoms and rights. The freedom to vote. The freedom to be safe from gun violence. The freedom to live without fear of bigotry and hate. The freedom to love who you love openly and with pride. The freedom to learn and acknowledge our true and full history. And the freedom of a woman to make decisions about her own. a fight for the future and for freedom. And I don't have to tell folks in Atlanta that generations of Americans before us led the fight for freedom. And now the baton is in our hands. Each and every one of us. And we love our country. We love our country, and I believe it is the highest form of patriotism to fight for the ideals of our country. And so, we who believe in the sacred freedom to vote will finally pass the Freedom to Vote Act and the John Lewis Voting Rights Act. believe in the freedom to live safe from gun violence will finally pass universal background checks, red flag laws, and an assault weapons ban. We who believe in reproductive freedom will stop Donald Trump's extreme abortion bans and when Congress passes a law to restore reproductive freedoms, as President of the United States, I will sign it into law. So November 5th, November 5th is in 98 days. And let's level set. Friends, let's level set. We have a fight in front of us. We have a fight in front of us. And we are the underdogs in this race. We are. But you see, this is a people-powered campaign. Ours is a people-powered campaign. In fact, after I announced my candidacy, we saw the best week of grassroots fundraising in presidential So the momentum in this race is shifting. And there are signs that Donald Trump is feeling it. You may have noticed. So 
Last week, you may have seen, he pulled out of the debate in September he had previously agreed to. So, so, so here's the thing. Here, here's the funny thing about that. Here's the funny thing about that. So he won't debate, but he and his running mate sure seem to have a lot to say about me. Don't you find some of their stuff to just be plain weird? Well, Donald, I do hope you'll reconsider to meet me on the debate stage. Because as the saying goes, if you've got something to say, say it to my face. have our work cut out for us. And this is not going to be easy. This is hard work, but we like hard work. Hard work is good work. So Georgia, today I ask you, are you ready to get to work? Do we believe in freedom? Do we believe in opportunity? Do we believe in the promise of America? ready to fight for it. And when we fight, we win. God bless you. God bless the United States. Kamala Harris with about a 20-minute stump speech that by any fair measure continues to get better. This her sixth campaign event since becoming the nominee apparent and endorsed by Joe Biden walking off uh, to a num one of a number of songs as I'm trying to listen in. It's been the Freedom Beyonce song for a while uh, that she normally has been walking off on, keeping uh, the theme, biggest chance, lock him up, referring to Donald Trump, not going back um, in terms of setting this up as a choice, a fork in the road for America, as she described it between the future and the past uh, back with George Will here. You mentioned hearing Kamala Harris starting to change her positions, and this may be the first time that I heard her specifically do that. Before, when she was running for president, it was free universal health care, it was free child care, it was free college. Now the word has been changed to affordable. Her affect tonight was very good. That is, a Trump rally is a prolonged snarl. He's an angry man with much to be angry about, as he tells it. She was a happy warrior. The a phrase originally applied to Al Smith in 1928, and again to Hubert Humphrey in 1968. Didn't work out well for either of them. <laughs> Neither did. The substance she has no problem with. Her two big promises were, she'll fix the border, which is a problem that grew worse geometrically, exponentially, under the Biden administration. And she said she will do something about the high cost of living, which reached a 40-year high. That whole crowd is young women, about half young white women and half young black women. And that is, I think, the support that she has been able to energize is, a, is young women. And we've seen that in the polling. We're now seeing that. Um, show up in the crowds when we look when we look not on the camera side or the Secret Service side of the barricade, but looking out from that as she works the rope line, um, that who is there, 
just listening to the crowd, and I have not been to a Kamala Harris rally in the middle of her speech. I emailed with our News Nation executives and said, I have to go out on the road and see this because you don't get to understand it unless you've been in the crowd. Um, the kind of roar that I heard in that crowd and the energy you could feel, even through the TV, Barack Obama 2008, Donald Trump 2016. There, there's something that she has captured there. Is it enough? And she's addressing the problem that the Biden campaign had as long as it existed, which was lassitude. A general absence of the energy you feel at Trump rallies and at her rally. So it's a, it's a campaign now to turn out the vote, energize your base, and as you say, expand the Democratic base a bit. There is something in this that she has apparently, and I say that because I watched her in 2020, this is a totally different candidate. Now, whether her views are different, her abilities are different, her competency as a leader and runner of the country is different, TBD. But her on the stump is markedly different and better. And she's using jujitsu in a political way. That is, Mr. Trump made a mistake when he said, I'm going to rethink debating her in September. He's going to debate her in September. There's no way he can avoid it. Otherwise, he will look at like two things he can't stand to look like, a loser and a weak person. The other thing that she has done, and I, we, I keep coming back to this, and things change, right? I mean, you know, two weeks ago, you and I were having a conversation about how Georgia was wrapped up, and now Republicans were on their way to Minnesota and New Hampshire. Now, latest polling has the swing states basically evenly split um, between the two of them. She just put out an ad about the border. Now, we can all reasonably agree, and reasonable people can agree, that the border has been a problem created by the Biden administration, exacerbated by it, and she was, in one way or another, the head of that program. But she just put out a, 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 an ad off the line in the speech where she said, and Donald Trump turn, demanded his party nix a bill that was supported by the Border Patrol, and you said, fact check true. Yes, not only supported by the Border Patrol, but put together by perhaps the most conservative man in the Senate, Senator Lankford of Oklahoma, a conservative Republican. Yeah, I'm just struck by the crowd here, um, both who's in the crowd um, and then also by the energy in it as well. I've not seen her work a rope line like this um, either. We're going to get that uh, change. That's not Reno. It's Atlanta, um, Georgia. Reno, Nevada is where J.D. Vance is. Uh, the crowds there are awaiting J.D. Vance, a fair to say a little bit smaller group there, why he won't talk about the one issue that everybody wants him to back in a minute. All right, back with live pictures of, well, this is the tape of Kamala Harris walking out in Atlanta to a raucous, and that means a raucous crowd. The screams, the cheers, something like, 2016 of Barack Obama, 2016 of Donald Trump, 2008 of Barack Obama. We'll take a quick listen. So he won't debate, but he and his running mate sure seem to have a lot to say about me. <laughs> and by the way, don't you find some of their stuff to just be plain weird? With us now, Rachel Palermo, former associate counsel to Kamala Harris, Hogan Gidley, former White House deputy press secretary in the Trump administration. I must say, a great-looking and well-dressed panel. Glad to have uh, both of you here. All right, Hogan, you're up first. Uh, okay. You got now, swing state polling has the swing states tied mm -hmm. and or in Harris's column. Okay, you're running against a guy who could barely get through a teleprompter speech versus 20 very impressive minutes uh, on the teleprompter. This race has wildly changed. Are there any Republicans who are privately saying, maybe we should have not gone after Joe Biden as hard? No, because Joe Biden and Kamala Harris are very similar. They own the same record. The difference between Kamala Harris and Joe Biden are twofold. One, of course, is Kamala Harris actually has a pulse. But second is she's more radical and she's less likable. What you saw in that speech right there was a complete repudiation of her own record. 
She said she wanted to fix the border. Oh, if only she had the power over the last four years to do that. I mean, Wait, the she did. Right. Oh, we can fix the economy. Oh, if you only had the lever of power to do so. Wait, that's right. You and Joe Biden ruined the economy. We're paying more for gas and for groceries. We hadn't even gotten to the fact that while she talks about Donald Trump being a criminal and how that little cute line she uses, but she ignores the 10 to 20 million criminals she let into this country and refuses to prosecute those who are in this country illegally who rape and murder and burglarize and assault okay. our own citizens. No, that, that was this will she was be the fight between now and the election because what she did while you say is raucous and while you say was impressive, it was a complete and total fabrication. The difference between now and then is we have to do everything we can to define her and not let her define herself because what you saw on that stage was 100% false. Okay. Uh, that would be an impressive statement if it was ever made by Donald Trump on the stump. He doesn't seem to be able to he coherently stuff like that a lot. Coherently get that that message as clear uh, as you just articulated, Rachel. Interestingly enough, Mark Halpern was on with us last night, um, noting that Kamala Harris is getting billions in earned media right now. She's getting yep. the same kind of moment that Donald Trump got in 2016. We all took a rally live. That that's worth an awful lot. Six day, nine days. She has been out. She has not done a single interview. Tomorrow, the National Association of Black Journalists issued an invitation to Donald Trump and to Kamala Harris. National Association of Black Journalists. And Donald Trump is the one who is showing up. Kamala Harris is not. How long is the on the teleprompter, totally protected campaign going to last? Um, I will get to that question, but I do first want to state my impression of the vice president's incredible speech tonight. She had uh -huh. thousands and thousands of people in the crowd. It leads off of a week that she had where she raised $200 million from donors. It was a historic amount of support that she's received. All stipulated, counselor. Two-thirds of those mm -hmm. donations were first-time donors, people who are excited. She's galvanizing Fundraising crowds. segments next. Answer the question. And also, I want to also <laughs> note that she laid out a vision of the future. She talked about wanting to move forward and not backwards. She talked about opportunity. She talked about the middle class. She talked about reproductive yeah, rights and uh, all. We, we heard the whole thing. Now, when is she going? When is, the, when is this candidate who talked about the importance of democracy? The importance of democracy is the importance of a press and speaking to the free press. She hasn't done that in nine days. She's turned down every interview request. She's even turned down the Association of Black Journalists. If this was Donald Trump, and I remember when Donald Trump didn't speak to the press for three days, the, the, the republic was over, and it was an assault on the media. Nine days she's gotten away with it. So I'd like to also say that Vice President Harris uh, has engaged media throughout the entire time that she's worked as vice president and she's oh, been no. on you're trail. entitled you're no. entitled your own opinion you're not entitled your own facts hogan answered I, I will, the question give me an answer i will get to i will get to your question okay. about nabj uh, from I, at first, I don't work for the vice president right. anymore, but I did see in public reporting that this was a clear scheduling conflict. Uh, and I also would like to say that throughout the three years I worked for her, she engaged NABJ consistently. She always oh, okay. gave but a place at this, the this table is, this is a, to this black is, journalists. Okay, this is a woman, though, who, when off script, is a disaster. She was a disaster in the Lester Holt interview. I disagree. Okay, well, you, you can disagree, but there's a reason that she, she doesn't go out there and do interviews. I covered the Pence, tr the Trump-Pence White House. Trump and Pence talked all the time to the media. I staffed she her does for not. hundreds of interviews. Uh, okay, well, how many network interviews? Many, dozens, and I'm happy to follow up with numbers. The vice president has always prioritized media. She's prioritized a free press. She's talked about and in the nine, in of... nine days, she took one gaggle question. The vice president has been talking okay. to thousands and thousands of voters over the last week. It has they, been a historic performance for any presidential candidate in history. What this she's is very over smart the last by the week. Democrats, what they're doing. You must keep her in a bubble. You must keep her on script. Once she deviates, it is a cavalcade of gaffes and of word salad that no one understands and an unpopular, radical, dangerous position that no one positions that no one likes. On top of that, the press is an interesting subject for me on this particular topic because only time will tell if they can make fetch happen for the ninth time because they haven't been able to to this point. But understand the power of the mainstream media. In three weeks, they were able to work together, galvanize, and unseat a sitting president. So if you don't think they can do everything in their power to try and make Kamala Harris, the same press, by the way, that told us that... Russiagate was real, that the Hunter Biden laptop and the Ashley Biden die were fake, and behind the scenes, Joe Biden was a triathlete 
doing all types of incredible physical ability skill challenges. The same press is telling us Kamala Harris, who they didn't like, didn't respect and didn't think was good is all of a sudden the savior of the okay. Democrat Party. Let me put, They're going to do everything in their power to make that a reality. Okay, so I'm going to I'm going to give you I'm going to give you the the last word here. What is the answer from Team Harris about Joe Biden's mental health? At some point, he, they're going to get it. How do they get out of that? I would like to say, I would first like to answer this question without being interrupted, and I would like to correct the record on a few things that we saw here tonight. Vice President Harris delivered an incredible speech tonight. She galvanized thousands of people. Okay, I, 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 look, I, I, gave, I gave you a chance to answer the question. If, but, you, can't, if you can't answer the question, just go back I've also to the talking been, points. It doesn't work. That's sort of the way this works. Thank you very I've, much. It was great having you. Okay. I've also thank been, you. Hogan, thank you very much. It was great having you. Thank you I've very also much. been interrupted every okay. time I tried to speak. 200,000 white dudes for Harris. 200,000 was an incredible number. Signed up on Zoom last night to support Kamala Harris. Were any of them, any of them, former Trump supporters? That's the important question when we come back. And All right, I that's Jeff. Am, but, uh... All right, Jeff Bridges, also known as, quote, the dude. From the Big Lebowski, for those of you who remember the show, was the surprise headliner at the White Dudes for Harris fundraiser. And you can see the trucker hat in the upper right-hand corner. Raised $4 million for Vice President Harris on Monday. The lead organizer of White Dudes for Harris, Ross Morales Raketo, is with us now. Did I get it right? You got it. All right, there we go. Uh, Very simple question. It seems as though this could have also been White Dudes for Biden but now who are excited, so they decided to do a Zoom. Fair? No, I, I would say we talked to a lot of people, many of whom are definitely going to vote for Vice President Harris, many of whom were going to vote for her anyway, many of whom were going to vote for Joe Biden. We also, any, any, anybody say, hey, I was a Trump guy, and now I'm here for Kamala Harris. We did. We had people spreading the word online, on Instagram, on TikTok. I got a bunch of Instagram messages this morning from folks who were like, I wasn't sure who I was going to vote for. I didn't, say, I didn't ask, didn't sure. Was there anybody who said, I was a Donald Trump guy, and now I'm a dude for Harris? Probably not. Okay. Okay, fair enough. I mean, no, I appreciate it. But, but to, to, to what your guy's point is, is this is the fight for the center. Yeah, this is the fight for the non-MAGA part of the electorate, basically. How much of this would have been possible, would you have even attempted, with Joe Biden still on the ticket? We probably wouldn't have been able to. Uh, Vice President Harris getting into the race has galvanized a ton of excitement. Honestly, I've been working in politics for 20, 25 years. I haven't seen it since 2008. And I would say 2016, Donald Trump. It's the same, we, we said that on TV. And I apologize for cutting this short. I could talk to you for a while, especially, uh, but we obviously took the rally for the whole time. Help me understand, though, you've got the excitement here. You're saying that that's going to translate in swing states with white guys. Are any of these guys, though, the fellows working 12 hours in a coal mine? That didn't seem, when I watched the videos from the Zoom, who was there, who that spoke to. I got messages, we got messages afterwards from regular working people, people who said they tuned in after work, folks who have disabilities, folks who, we had a folk person who worked at Target who reached out to us afterwards. You know, we had 200 million, or sorry, we had 200,000 people get on. Yeah. We had 100,000 people watch today. That is, you know, five times the number of voters that decided the 2016 election. We think that if white men get out there and organize on behalf of Vice President Harris, she's got a real shot at winning. I agree with that. I mean, that would that would definitely change the game. Hey, we're going to have you back. This is a great conversation. Thanks for having thank me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, the dude for Harris right here. Um, right now, J.D. Vance out in Reno, Nevada. The crowd awaits him. Who will Kamala Harris pick as her vice president? And how will J.D. Vance, or whoever that is, help win Pennsylvania? There's the race to 270. We filled in the swing states. We gave Nevada to Trump, Arizona to Harris. Uh, We gave Georgia to Harris, where she just was. That puts all roads to the presidency through Pennsylvania. Join us now, network anchor at ABC 27, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Also their chief political reporter. He moderated the last debate between Fetterman and Oz and is with us now. Good to see you, my friend. Uh, 
In Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, there's a guy named Josh Shapiro waiting to get the phone call if he's going to be the vice president. He's the governor. Could he deliver Pennsylvania for Kamala Harris? Will Harris take the guy from Harrisburg, or at least the guy that lives here? I think he checks a lot of boxes, Leland, no question about it. There is gender and geographic uh, balance. He is very popular here. Remember, as you just noted, uh, presidential elections are decided by a relative handful of votes in a relative handful of states, and Pennsylvania is the largest of those with 19 uh, electoral votes. And this election will be a one- or two-point race. If she were to select Josh Shapiro, it is not unreasonable to think Pennsylvania would go for the Harris Shapiro ticket. He is that popular there, Jewish. He'd be the first Jewish vice president. I had Mark Halpern on yesterday. He said, look, they're finding something in everybody's background that presents a problem. You know Josh Shapiro better than most, covered his governor's race. What, what is the skeleton? What's the problem for him? Uh, for Harris if she picks well, him. Well, he's, he's very, he's very pro-Israel, as you know. A lot of folks think that that could cost some votes in Michigan. There's also one incident. I want to be very clear about this. No one is suggesting that Josh Shapiro was involved in sexual harassment, but one of his top staffers and longtime friends, an underling, says she was sexually harassed and feels that the Shapiro administration didn't act forcefully enough hmm. uh, on that. Uh, so that could Got be it. an issue moving forward. All right, we'll see you tomorrow night at the Trump rally about this time in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Yep. Speaking about it, exactly how important it is. Great seeing you. A lot more we'll coverage of this be map. Well. Yes, you will, you will see us up in Pennsylvania. Tomorrow, Kamala Harris's speech. There's something we picked up on. You wouldn't know about it. We'll tell you tomorrow.